Our guest and I really had just told me he wanted to title his book From Horse to Helicopter. Uh, and as you can see by the cover, it's something else. It's called The Soldier Reports, but it's General William Westmoreland's story. Uh, General, I like From Horse to Helicopter better than this one. Uh, why didn't you name it that? Well, it was a memoir, and I suppose that would have been an appropriate name, but I, I wanted to get the word soldier in it. I think a soldier report encompasses it, but uh, of course the centerpiece of that is my Vietnam story, a story that hadn't been told till now. Well, what's the essential story of Vietnam that hasn't been told? I thought it had about all been <laughs> let out. Well, it's been told by a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, there's been a lot written, but frankly, a lot of it was based on misinformation and misunderstandings, and some of it was fabricated, I must admit, uh, to make a quick buck during that emotional era. I wrote the book with really several purposes in mind. First, I wanted to make known to the American people that the uh, U.S. military didn't lose that war. It was lost by the politicians. It was, fr frankly, a political default. Uh, secondly, I wanted to uh, correct some misconceptions that had been perpetrated on the American people. Uh, next, uh, I wanted to make known to the American people that man in uniform served admirably under very difficult circumstances. And finally, I felt that if I did not contribute to the written history of that period, a history yeah. of that emotional period would be incomplete. Well, you know, let me give you some reactions I have to the, to the Vietnam War. So, some are, are biased and so forth, but they cut across some general feelings. First of all, I always felt that people in your position, and you particularly, I don't want to use the word lie, but misrepresented what was really going on at the time in your briefings that you would have. And it particularly comes to mind when I think of the Tet Offensive when it seemed that the military leadership, which would include you, tried to say that that really wasn't a route of our forces, when it seemed to us that it was. Now, mm -hmm. yes. Well, response? that's a very good question and a very appropriate question. I address it in this book because it's, it's a very crucial question. The fact is that the Tet Offensive, which was a reaction to the great success we had in 1967, where the enemy had two objectives. One was to defeat the American and South Vietnamese armies, and secondly, to, to uh, create a public uprising among the South Vietnamese people. They failed on both counts, and this was uh, a, a severe defeat of Hanoi, uh, her army, and uh, her, her, her political aspirations in this regard. It was not well reported by the press, and I think any uh, reasonable and objective uh, newsman will admit that they misled, the, the media misled the American people by giving the impression that we were the one defeated. Uh, I tried to tell them that this was a temporary setback, but in the final analysis, the enemy was going to be defeated, but uh, of course they wouldn't accept that, but, but they will all accept it now. But you appreciate the, the, the impression from here was that uh, it was like a guy on a ship which is about to go under, and you're saying any minute we'll have this under control, and you're you're going out of sight. Well, that certainly was the impression <laughs> given, but it was a false impression, and it was not the fault of the military. The military reporting at that time was very accurate, and the forecasts that were made by myself and others turned out to be accurate. Uh, the, the people at Arrow were the, uh, the people that reported it on the scene, and, they re and I, I, I can't be too hard on them for the simple reason that this was the first war ever uh, covered by the media without benefit of censorship. And this is the first war ever covered on the television screen and piped into the homes of America. Right. And the war was reported like crime on the police beat or a political campaign, no holds barred, where news is the unusual and the sensational. And when something sensational uh, occurred, which the Tet Offensive was, I mean, they just went all out. And it gave the American people a false impression. That, of course, seems to be a, a, your view you're expressing is a minority view, I think you appreciate, of all the books that have been written. And uh, I guess it's, is, is it fair to say it's predictable that you, that would be your viewpoint? <laughs> well, I don't think that's an accurate <laughs> statement. Okay. Uh, Oberdorf's uh, book on Tet, uh, a man named uh, Baestrup uh, have, has uh, recently written two volumes uh, mm -hmm. on the reporting of the Tet Offensive, and he's, he's critical of the press. Uh, and the fact is that uh, books that have been written today are not authentic books. I was in a position of responsibility and authority. I can document what I say in that in my files. Okay. So the, this, the essential message then that you're saying is that we, what could we have done if the politicians had left the army alone? Well, I cover that. We could have, uh, we could have succeeded in our objectives, but we what? failed. And uh, see, my concern is that we're going to make the same mistakes again. And I, I cover the various factors, uh, the political decisions that, uh, that interfered with, uh, with uh, a, a victory or success. Success is a better word than victory in view of yeah. the nature of the conflict. 
And of course, I point out in this book uh, some of the uh, political mistakes that were made, uh, which had an impact on American public opinion. Well, I'm interested in your terms of success. What, in, in what could have been our successful objective, as you put it? What well, uh, you know, finally, we brought the enemy to the conference table. Uh, after uh, the enemy was given an incentive following the mining of the high farm harbors and the B-52s on important military targets. Do you realize that Lee Duck Toe and his colleagues went to Paris in 1972 uh, uh, mm -hmm. and actually wept and said, you've got to let us out of this. Uh, we can't take it anymore. Now, the point is, and I make this in the book, that this could have happened uh, four years earlier after the Tet Offensive when the enemy was defeated. He was crushed. Uh, his morale was down. I know that to be a fact. I knew it at the time. If we had escalated at that time and put pressure on the enemy and given him uh, uh, incentive to negotiate, the war could have been brought to a close uh, at least four years earlier, and those lives could have been saved. Now, uh, when we de-escalated the war, President Johnson de-escalated the war, he enticed the enemy, following the Tet Offensive, to the conference table. They sat there for four years and looked at each other and decided one thing only, and that was the shape of the conference table. Because we provided no incentive for the enemy to do otherwise. But later on, uh, in 1972, that incentive uh, was provided. Well, I don't know how to deal with you from, from at this point. What you're saying is it's so at odds with so many of the things I've read and some of the things I feel, and not all, but yet I know you were there. You're an honorable man. You believe what you're saying. and, and uh, the, the phrase comes to my mind, I wonder what you think, that war is too important to be left to generals. Yes, I use that. That's an uh, expression of uh, the, uh, the famous uh, French uh, diplomat and politician, Clemenceau. Right. And I, uh, it's, uh, I think, quite appropriate. I used to uh, use that expression frequently when I met the press, uh, <laughs> when I was uh, in, in charge of our forces in Vietnam. But on the other hand, uh, it shouldn't be exclusively left to the politicians. Uh, when our country makes the very difficult decision to send our young men to war, the country has an obligation to support them. And uh, under those circumstances, the military should have a much louder voice than they did during the course of that, uh, that, that conflict, which uh, was, was a disgraceful thing for the United States. We actually entice this young country to our bosom and in the final analysis, we deserted them and we betrayed them, and this is nothing to be proud of. Do you feel personally that Vietnam was a failure for you as a general and as a military I, man? No, I, I do not. Uh, I, uh, I, let, uh, I let the record of my performance uh, during my four and a half years uh, stand on its own, and uh, I uh, have no concern as to the way history will judge it. Let's talk about the military. Uh, it, that war seemed to do terrible things to the status of the military in this country, in the minds of people. Uh, do you agree with that observation, first of all? Well, I think so. Uh, uh, it, uh, the, we failed in our objective. Uh, there were forces at work when the country became divided, and I've analyzed why the country became divided in this yeah. book. Uh, it. Uh, it created in the minds of a lot of Americans, particularly uh, uh, the young people on the campus, that uh, the military was, uh, was an evil institution. Uh, the war was evil, immoral. And of course, this is, was a result of many factors, one of which was a, a very miserable and very discriminatory pro uh, uh, policy uh, of the executive and legislative branches to allow a young man to escape military service if he goes to the campuses of the country, and which many of them did. Right. Vietnam was a war of the lower economic classes, basically. It was fought by the poor man's son, and this is another tragedy. It was fought by the poor man's son because that uh, very discriminatory practice of college educational deferments from the draft uh, uh, attracted uh, a major portion of the young men of the more fluent a segment of our society to the campus. How about some of the stories that we heard, uh, at least that I heard, that uh, people in your position live very plush lives in Saigon, far from the agony and the misery of war, and that you really didn't uh, have an understanding of what it was really like, at least in Vietnam. I know you've been in combat in other wars. But... Well, I fought three wars, and I must say I was out with my troops constantly. I was out uh, for at least uh, four days a week. Uh, I'd leave in the morning, I'd come back uh, at dusk. I was with my troops constantly. 
Uh, yes, I, I had uh, comfortable quarters there. I wouldn't say they were plush, but they were comfortable. But uh, after all, I was there for four and a half years. I was separated from my family three and a half of those years. My family was there with three young children the first year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I cover that uh, period of that uh, particular tour of service in my book. Uh, this was quite difficult on my wife and the children. And, of course, it was a major concern to me, and I was very happy when the president ordered dependents home. And then for three years, of course, my wife had to raise those three kids by herself. Right. Well, I always wonder about how you, how you deal with it. I, I read several books. One I recall is, by, is called Body Count by a local man, uh, Bill Huggett. He was a, an officer in Vietnam. And one of the points he was, he was making in the book is that it becomes just a numbers thing. It's the body count is a number thing. It doesn't relate to the death and the agony and the misery. And I wonder, talk about that for a moment as a general. Well, see, idea. this was uh, uh, the constraints imposed by the politicians resulted in it being a no-win war. Uh, Mr. McNamara was our Secretary of Defense. Mr. McNamara was very statistical-minded. Yeah. Uh, it was very difficult by virtue of the war of attrition that was thrust upon the military by virtue of these political constraints to measure progress or lack thereof. Uh, the word body count actually started in the early 60s, uh, long before I got there, long before we uh, put American troops there. And it uh, was a technique that the Vietnamese instituted themselves to try to appease the press because the press were questioning the reports that were made from the battlefield. In order to try to give a greater validity uh, 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 as to the casualties inflicted on the enemy, uh, and, and to satisfy the press, uh, they started this word body count. Now, this was a very repugnant term to me, but we were stuck with it. Yeah. How about words like morality, sin, right, wrong? How, how do they relate to a professional soldier in terms of war? I mean, we, we tend to think of war as uh, Well, glamour. you know, professional soldiers have a very high code of ethics, uh, not only uh, with respect to uh, uh, their, their personal conduct, uh, uh, where we hope that the commission officers honest in word indeed, and I think uh, most of them are. Yeah. And this is so important on the battlefield, and so important in view of the sensitive uh, uh, situations that uh, they have to encounter. Uh, but uh, there's also uh, an uh, international uh, agreement uh, associated with the laws of war which uh, referred to as the, uh, the, the Geneva Conventions. And this prescribes certain things that you can or cannot do on the battlefield. Now, uh, every uh, soldier, of course, has the right and the duty to defend himself. Every soldier has the right and duty to, uh, to carry out his orders as long as those orders are legal. But no soldier has a duty. As a matter of fact, he is prohibited from carrying out an illegal order. And, uh, of course, uh, the My Lai incident, which, uh, yes, which right. everybody is so sensitive to. Right. Uh, it is alleged that an illegal order was given uh, uh, and uh, at the company level. Uh, I, uh, uh, that matter, of course, was dealt with in the courts. As far as Lieutenant Kelly is concerned, uh, uh, he, he was tried and convicted, and he, he was associated with the illegal conduct, uh, not only in the matter of supervising his men, but also in leading his men in illegal action. Now, I have um, no sympathy for what Callie did, but I have compassion, because Callie was a victim of that educational deferment policy. In all other wars, the military had drawn their officers from the college campuses. Mm -hmm. That pool of officers were denied the military during the Vietnam War. Uh, the anti-war activists uh, struck out at ROTC and practically crippled that on the campus. Therefore, in order to procure the officers that were needed, uh, the Army and the other services, to a lesser degree, had to lower their standards, and some marginal people, uh, Lieutenant Calley being a case in point, were commissioned. If it had not been for the educational affirmative policy, Lieutenant Calley would have never been an officer. Do you think he was a scapegoat? In other words, should more people have been punished for Milo? Well, any number were charged, and any yeah. number were tried, but of course, uh, 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 the military court system is just like the civilian court system. Yeah. They can be indicted, they can be put to the grand jury, and they can be put before a jury. Uh, but uh, the jury has to decide. 
Are you bitter about Vietnam? No, you you, I, I, and there's no bitterness in my book, and I don't yeah. think you, uh, yeah. well, no, you I got don't. a bitter tone in my, my comment. Well, I do occasionally. I get yeah. a feeling that you're the press no, and no, the politicians. No, and, no, let's put it this way. Yeah. Uh, I think that we, uh, we should realize that Vietnam was a failure. Uh, uh, it's nothing that America should be proud of. We should not sweep it under the rug. We should study where we, we failed. Because America in the past has is, is normally uh, accomplished what it set out to do. In this yeah. case, we did not accomplish it. So there are lessons to be learned, and if these lessons are heated in the future, we can come out a stronger nation. But I am not one to sweep it under the rug, nor am I one to look for witches. I think the Congress has found all the witches uh, we can tolerate for the moment. Uh, but uh, you will note no bitterness in my book, uh, but uh, I, I think you will find that my book uh, is an objective one. And if uh, there's a tone of bitterness in my, um, in my language, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a matter of emphasis, not bitterness. Okay, fine. Very quickly, we don't have too much time, but there's a lot of things to ask you. You retired and went, you ran for governor of South Carolina. Uh, for the uh, uh, Republican nomination. Right. Why? Well, President Ford called me, uh, Arnold Ronald Reagan uh, encouraged me, uh, George Bush twisted my arm, they ran a draft Westmoreland campaign, and finally I got in the position where I felt that I would be, say, turning my back on uh, the people of my home state, a state that I had lived in in 40 years, I might add, but mm -hmm. if I didn't get involved, and I thought at the time that if I uh, made no other contribution, I would uh, be associated with developing a, a stronger two-party system, which was very much needed in the state of South Carolina. And I succeeded in that regard in that uh, we now have our first Republican governor. And I feel that this country should have two viable political parties. Did you see any difference uh, from, uh, from the politicians uh, in party loyalty in terms of the conduct of the war? Did, were Republican politicians more sensitive to the military needs, or were the Democrats? Or well, uh, the Vietnam War was, was not an issue, and uh, nobody tried to use it uh, against me during the course of, uh, of this campaign. Uh, let me uh, hasten to add that I was a very poor politician. I was uncomfortable, and I was just about as inept as you could get as a politician, <laughs> really? as you probably could suspect. No, suspect. I think you'd be great. You have a <laughs> but, great presence. But, but uh, not well. really. I, uh, I, I, was, uh, I, I really was, uh, was very inept, and I was very un uncomfortable. But. The Vietnam War was, was, was not a campaign issue. But one thing, and this is an interesting point, that was an issue. As a military officer, and a military officer must be apolitical and nonpartisan, I had never voted. Really? Yeah. Now, you can understand that, and I think anybody who's sure. ever been in the service can understand it, but the average voter, he couldn't understand that. For that just to be said sounds like a real slam. It really does. Uh, yeah. And it, it's, uh, unless one is, had, uh, understands and has been associated with the military and realizes why they have to be nonpartisan, uh, it, it uh, can give the connotation uh, that uh, you're not civic minded. Yeah, yeah. Will we have another great war? When I say great war, I'm thinking of World War II. What, what's down the road? Well, you know, perhaps the wisest of all philosophers, Plato, said only the dead have seen the end of war. And I think this is a, probably a true statement, regrettably. I mean, uh, mankind has been searching for utopia in the absence of war for, uh, for generations and centuries, and we will continue to do that. But really, the best road to peace is to be prepared for war, and of course, this is one of the dictums of George Washington. Yeah. And if we lower our, uh, uh, our guard, uh, if we reduce our military forces to the point where a would-be enemy perceives us as a pushover, uh, we could have another war. Okay, but now, I hear it constantly said that because of uh, atomic power, all forms of conventional war are gone. Do you agree with that? No, not in the least. Uh, of course, now that we've got two countries that uh, have huge uh, nuclear arsenals and several other countries that have small ones, uh, both uh, all countries, and particularly uh, the United States and Russia, are, are very aware of the fact that uh, if there is war, both countries are, are going to suffer and suffer severely. Yeah. And hopefully this will be a deterrent against the use of nuclear weapons. But below that threshold, where you get into conventional weapons, uh, the 
prospect of the use of conventional weapons, if there, there comes a conflict that cannot be decided by political means and uh, diplomatic action, and where uh, there's a great deal at stake for, for our country, such as our physical security, uh, the viability of our economy that could be jeopardized by actions uh, by hostile power, uh, or if our, our freedom, of course, uh, is, is being threatened. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, war is, is quite conceivable uh, in our national interest, and I think it will have to be in our national interest, and the Congress and the people will have to be convinced of that before we go to war. But even at that, it would be very foolish to go to nuclear war, because we uh, inevitably, we are going to suffer greatly by virtue of this, but uh, by conventional war, uh, and that's why it's so important that we have these conventional forces, uh, we would be in a position to protect our interests. I hear people say that the military, and I don't mean in, in any reflection on you because you're a very obviously brilliant man, but that the military does its best to only percolate to the top those people willing to go along to keep their mouths shut to not cause waves, to not dispute. And I think we all know that all institutions need activists and people right. who are willing to say that's wrong. But uh, what, what's your observation? Well, I think that's a very perceptive comment that you've made. And I think in any highly regimented uh, institution, uh, there is a tendency in that direction. When I was the chief staff of the Army, I was very sensitive to this. And I revised the Army's fitness report, the Army's efficiency yeah. report. And I put an item in there that every rating officer had to, uh, had to address. Is this officer a yes man? Because I hate yes men. And I always told my staff, I want you to be critical of my decisions and let's fight it out. But I said, once I have made my decision, and after you've had your day in court, so to speak, right. uh, we cannot accomplish a mission unless we close ranks and, 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 and get about it. I'm glad to hear you say that. I uh, wish we had a, another half an hour to go. You're obviously a man of ideas. You had a heart attack. Are you fully recovered? I had uh, a setback about two years ago, yeah. uh, but uh, the doctor says I can uh, do anything now. I'm Good. under no uh, dietary or uh, uh, control, or I take no medication. And I'm playing golf, and well, I can not play tennis again, but I haven't started that yet. Well, that's all right. General Westmoreland, thanks very much for being with us. We'll be right back.